Today, it's time to upgrade the Amiga power supply and avoid any potential problems in the future. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. Let's go back to the Amiga 500 from a few episodes ago. Today, we're going to focus on the power supply specifically, and I have two main goals for it. The first one is making it usable in the United States. Now, that means making it work with 110 volts and the different plug shape. The second one is just making it more reliable. Some of these Amiga power supplies can fail pretty easily, so I usually prefer to upgrade them like we're about to do. Let's start by having a look at the original power supply. It's definitely a bit yellow still, but the sun never managed to bring it back to its original color, so we'll have to live with that. It comes with a British plug, which is something we'll have to change for this. One of the interesting things about the British plugs is that they always have a built-in fuse in the plug itself. I don't know of any other countries that have that. I believe this was due to some copper shortages after World War II, but now it's an added safety feature, but I'm sure it must increase quite a bit the cost of every device having to have a special plug just to import them in the country. Tom Scott, one of my favorite channels, has a whole video about the British plug, so check it out if you want to know more about it. Apart from that, this power supply feels really light. It turns out there are two main types of Amiga power supplies, Type 1, which are pretty heavy, and Type 2, which are much more lightweight. And as you can see here, the difference is pretty huge. The Type 1 is almost three times heavier than the Type 2, almost a full kilogram. They both look very similar on the outside though, but as you can imagine, the electronics inside are quite different. Another thing to keep in mind about Amiga power supplies is that, well, they're not very reliable, especially the Type 2 ones. Here's a picture of an Amiga power supply that failed on me a few years ago. See that capacitor in there? Yeah, it's gone. On the plus side, when these power supplies go, they make a loud pop and maybe release some magic smoke, but they don't usually damage the computer along the way, so there's always that. This one in particular is a light Type 2 one, so let's open it up and see what's inside. And yeah, not much. A transformer, some big caps, a bridge rectifier, and little else. It looks like a very standard power supply. Let's pull it out of the case. And yeah, we'll be using the on-off switch and some of the cables later. There's definitely not much going on in this power supply, mostly just air inside the bulky case. So in order to replace this power supply, we need something else that generates the same voltages. And there are a variety of voltages, DC voltages, all of them, fortunately, going into the Amiga with this connector. And on the back of the case, it says that. So we need 5 volts, 12 volts, and minus 12 volts. And then we need mostly a lot of current on the 5 volt rail. It's 4.5 amps, and then smaller amounts on the other ones. And so for that, we have multiple options. But I generally like to look at Meanwell power supplies. They're very well done, they're reliable, they're not likely to explode, so all those are good things. And these particular ones, they output those three kinds of voltages. Also another requirement for us is that they both work with 220 volts and 110 volts. So they'll be good both in Europe and the US and pretty much anywhere else in the world, which is one of the main things that we want out of this transformation of the power supply. One nice thing about these Meanwell power supplies is that while they're not dirt cheap, they're actually not that expensive for the quality you get. So you can usually buy them for around 15 euros or so. So either one of these two models will fit inside the case. This one obviously fits there with lots of room. And this one fits just barely, but that's fine. That's even better because really the challenge now is to make sure that it doesn't move while it's in the case. You know, there's the whole top of the case and you don't want it to rattle around or even move because it will eventually damage the cables and such. So what I decided to do with this one is go with the smaller model in a very, very simple 3D printed support. This is specifically for this model of the power supply. There are different models. This one is the 312503 and then things like 02. It has to be exactly that because otherwise they have the supports in different places. And there are other supports for other models of the case. So just make sure that you get the corresponding one to the one that you have. So this one in particular fits like this. It's not screwed on to the case itself, but once the top comes down, it will be screwed in place and it will be secured. And then those screw holes are there exactly for our power supply in the middle, like that. So that would fit perfectly. So let's go with that one. 
But before we put this in place, there's one thing we need to do, and it's going to require some slight modification of the case. I want to change the power cord because this plug will not work. Well, it will not work here in Spain and it will not work in the US where it's intended to go. And I don't want to just use an adapter. It would, you know, it's okay for as a temporary solution, but not as a permanent one. And I don't have an exact Amiga cord. So instead of that, what, what I'm going to do is I want to use one of these generic power cords that you see often in PCs and tools and things like that. And what we're going to do is put a I think this is called an IEC socket. So we can put it here in the case, and then you can use whichever cord you want matching your plug system. The idea is to put it right here where this hole is for the connector, which has extend that and make it large enough to put this in here. And then that would let us have a European plug, a US plug or whatever. And for that, we're going to have to do some cutting in there. So it's time to get the Dremel out. The first thing to do is mark the shape of the socket on the case. The socket has taper corners, so it's not supposed to be a perfect rectangle. I'll just make a slightly smaller approximation and make the hole larger later until it fits. And now is when it gets serious. I'll clamp the base so it's held in position securely. And of course, before we start cutting into it, I put some safety goggles. And let's go. As I said, this is not intended to be a precision cut, so I'll definitely start smaller. And yeah, it's clear that it doesn't fit, so I'll cut a bit more. Ouch, the plastic was melted and it burnt my finger a bit. Okay, that seems to fit now. Before we can put the top half of the case, I need to cut off that lip. This is pretty trivial in comparison to the other cut. Now I'll file the hole a bit, mostly to get rid of any particularly rough section, because the shape is already fine. And let's try it together. Perfect. The next step is to mark the places where we're going to put the screws. Drill a hole in each of them. And screw them in place. I'm actually not threading the screw into the case. I have nuts on the other side to hold everything together. And that looks fantastic now. Okay, with this in place, now we can start talking about assembling the rest of the board. But for that, we need to understand very clearly what the three prongs are in here and what the output voltages are. I don't usually work directly with AC voltages from the mains, so let's go over a quick summary of what we're up against. Mains plugs in all countries I'm aware of usually have three cables. One of them is called live and is the one with a positive potential voltage. And don't forget, it's alternating. This is AC current. The other one is neutral and is the one where current will flow back. And one thing to keep in mind is that even though it's called neutral, it isn't always at the same potential voltage as ground. So it's a good idea to avoid touching it just in case. And the third one is earth or ground, and it's there for safety rather than to complete a circuit. In case of some catastrophic failure, it's there to give the current a place to go instead of going through a person, for example. So not all mains plugs have this cable, but yeah, it's a good idea to have. It's important to connect the live and neutral cables to the correct locations, and things are usually labeled that way. If you look inside the IEC connector, you'll see three terminals correctly labeled L for live, N for neutral, and E for earth. The meanwhile power supply is also labeled ACL and ACN, alternating currents live and neutral. If you ever have any doubts, cables are usually color-coded to indicate which cable it is, although unfortunately, those colors vary a bit from country to country. 
As you can see in this table, in Europe, the live cable is brown, neutral is blue, and Earth is that striped yellow and green. Which is exactly what we saw in the original cables of the power supply, so all of that makes sense. The meanwhile power supply also comes with some connectors for both the input and output voltages, but I don't have the matching connectors to use, so I'm going to desolder them and we'll solder the cables directly on the board. This is not something I'm going to be removing from the case on a regular basis, so it will be perfectly fine. And I absolutely love it when you desolder something and it falls right out. When things are extra stubborn, like they're being now, one very useful tip is to take the soldering iron, crank up the temperature, I normally have it at 320, so I just crank that up to 400, and use it at the same time as the desoldering device. And the two together just melt the solder right away and you can suck it right up. It makes a world of a difference. So it's time to wire everything together and let's start with the AC side. I'm going to obviously reuse the switch since it fits right on the case and even the cables with the connectors. So the switch is on the live wire, so the brown one, that would be that one. And then we'll solder directly neutral to here and then earth to this terminal right here. Now it's time for the DC cables. They're pretty straightforward, and here they're labeled V1, which is five volts, calm, ground, and V2 and V3, and if there's any doubts, they're actually listed here. So V1 is five volts, V2 plus 12, and V3 minus 12. And so this is ground, this is five volts, and then of these two, brown is plus 12, and white is minus 12, and this is earth. And so all we have to do is the earth terminals, and those are supposed to go here. And then in addition to that, on the Meanwell data sheet, they actually recommend tying those two terminals for best performance, they say. So I just made a cable like this, and the idea is that when we screw that there, it will make connection. And so I will actually solder the earth terminals to those two washers and that way everything will be connected correctly. And so here it is with everything screwed back in place. And let's test the cable to make sure that everything fits correctly. And yeah, it fits very nice and tightly there. So yeah, I think this is gonna work out great. Before closing everything and trying it on with the Amiga, I want to make sure that we get approximately the right voltages. And we have a slight problem, which is that there's a feedback in here and the output voltage will be adjusted a little bit based on the load. So the 12 and minus 12 voltages may not be very accurate at all. I just want to make sure that I got the right one, that I didn't accidentally put plus 12 where it's supposed to be minus 12 or so. The 5 volt one should be spot on. So let's start measuring that one. And I'll use my trick with the shrink tubing to make sure we don't touch any other leads. And the switch is on. So I'm going to turn it on from the power strip far away, just in case anything happens. And this is set to voltage. Yep, let's see what happens. Perfect, five volts. Okay, I'm gonna turn it off. I don't wanna spend there too long since, as I said, there's no load. Normally you would test this with a real load on the power supply, but I don't have the right device. I don't even have what they call power resistors. 
there'll be a resistor that maybe can take two amps through it, which I think is the bare minimum load that this should take. So that one in the corner should be plus 12. Yeah, approximately, okay. The middle one should be minus 12. Okay, good enough. It looks like this particular model doesn't have any other adjustments that we can do. The other model of Meanwell power supply that I showed at the beginning had an adjustment that once it's fully loaded, you could you know, tweak it a little bit to get it up or down. It's probably not all that necessary and this one doesn't have it. So we're just going to close the case and give it a try with the real Amiga. I think this looks great. It matches very nicely. I mean, too bad this is still yellow. But uh, I think the add-on of the socket there works really well. Yeah, I mean, somebody who doesn't know how this was at the beginning, they might think it came like this originally. And then this fits really, really nicely and securely and everything. And now it's finally time to test it with a real Amiga. I'll be using the same Amiga 500 we saw last time with the internal GoTech and the fixed RAM expansion and the real-time clock. One thing about the GoTech, I actually changed the bracket I used originally. Since we have the GoTech screen mounted on the top, I chose a slightly different bracket that centers the USB stick on the drive opening. That will make it even easier to access and we can still push the two buttons comfortably. Let's turn it on. Okay, so far so good. I see the display on the GoTech and it's starting to load. Everything seems fine so far. I'm first going to load Workbench. I want to check that the time is still being held correctly with the fixed real-time clock expansion from the last Amiga video. And yeah, look at that. It has the right date and time, even though I didn't power it on for a couple of weeks. So that confirms that we did that correctly, at least. Perfect. Workbench loads fine. So I'm expecting that everything else is going to be fine. But just in case, let's load up one of my favorite games, Rainbow Islands. Actually, I mostly played this on the arcade. Hi, Jim. But the Amiga version is almost identical, so it feels very familiar. And yeah, everything works great. Graphics, sound, and everything. So I think this power supply is working perfectly. The power supply looks really great. And really, this is probably the way they should have done it instead of having the power cord permanently attached there. So in this particular case, this was a no-brainer because I needed to change it for the US electrical system. But I have done the same thing to my own power supplies here just for the added reliability of the Meanwell internals. It's not that expensive and it's pretty easy to do, so I really highly recommend it for anyone. We still have one more episode with this Amiga for testing out the Pi Storm, which should be interesting because I keep getting people reminding me it's not a fire and forget solution and it requires a lot of tweaking, so it should be interesting to dig into that. Anyway, that's all I had for today. As usual, leave me any comments below and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.